attended by the Queen, her final rites represent the first ceremonial funeral for a Prime Minister since that of Sir Winston Churchill. The Right Honorable Margaret Hilda Thatcher, the Baroness Thatcher of Castephen, and from 1979 to 1990, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Today on Uncommon Knowledge, a man who knew Lady Thatcher for more than 40 years. Joining us from London, the author and journalist John O'Sullivan. Uncommon Knowledge, now. John O'Sullivan grew up in the north of England, received his degree from the University of Liverpool, and has had an extensive career as a journalist on both sides of the Atlantic, serving, for example, as parliamentary sketch writer for the London Telegraph and as editor-in-chief of the American magazine National Review. During much of the 1980s, Mr. O'Sullivan served at Number 10 Downing Street as special advisor and speechwriter to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Mr. O'Sullivan is author of the best-selling book the President, the Pope, and the Prime Minister, three who changed the world. John, let me begin by quoting to you Margaret Thatcher, quote, I love debate. I don't expect anyone to just sit there and agree with me, close quote. John, when and how did you first meet Margaret Thatcher? Well, I first met her over lunch in the House of Commons when there was a small group of parliamentary sketch writers, people who treated Parliament as if it were a drama and wrote a review of it, um, and she was the Minister of Education. And I was the only Conservative around the table apart from her. And I was a disciple of Milton Friedman, just back from California, with exciting details of the voucher scheme, the voucher experiment in Allen Rock, which I started to preach to her. And she was in a liberal government, fundamentally, under Ted Heath. She didn't have complete freedom of action. And anyway, at that stage, I don't suppose she'd reached the point of believing in educational vouchers. But she disagreed with me. And the two of us had a ding-dong battle uh, back and forth for about 20 minutes. Um, when she left, uh, everyone else around the table, all these left-wingers, they fell about in their chairs laughing. And one of them said to me, you know, uh, you're the only person here who's got any time for it. She probably thinks you're some kind of dangerous subversive. But she, later on I discovered that, as you said, Mrs. Thatcher loved people to, who argued with her. She loved debate, she loved argument, she loved um, um, the whole rhetorical combat. That was all important to her. And um, people who argued with her went up in her estimation and she tended to like them. And so I was lucky. From that point on, um, whenever she saw me in the Commons and elsewhere, she knew, um, she, she, she knew what I was, was. I mean, first of all, not only did I debate with her, but I debated with her from her right. So she uh, knew I wasn't a soft uh, liberal. I was one of us. I see. John, that would have been, what year did you say, 1972 or so? 72, yeah. And she was a minister in the Heath government. Out of office in 1975, the Conservative Party holds an election. Anyone would have told you, any close political observer would have told you, even a few days before the election, that Keith Joseph, not Margaret Thatcher, but her friend Keith Joseph, would challenge the then former Prime Minister Edward Heath for the leadership of the Conservative Party. In the event Margaret Thatcher challenged Heath and defeated him. In that contest, where did Margaret Thatcher come from? Well, that's a good question. And I think I've got a little scoop for you here, a very minor one, I'm afraid. Uh, on the day, of, day or two after the election in 74, the second election, I rang up Keith Joseph along with Frank Johnson. And the two of us said to him, you're being taken to the cleaners because you don't have a good press operation. And when, you say this, when you say the 1974 election, that's when the Heath government was defeated. For the second time. Before the second time, right. Uh, no, for the second time. It lost two elections uh, right. in that year. And um, uh, on the Sunday after the Thursday, uh, we rang Keith up, Frank and I, a colleague on the Daily Telegraph, and we said to him, you're being taken to the cleaners because you don't have a good press operation. And uh, therefore, you're getting uh, days like today in which every major front page story was how Willie Whitelaw was going to succeed Ted Heath and it had all been a stitched, uh, stitched up. Well. Keith said, this is very interesting, gentlemen, come round and see me tomorrow. So um, we turned up at 11 o'clock, a, a nice Deb uh, took us into a waiting room, gave us two cups of coffee, then the door opened and in walked Mrs. Thatcher. 
Now, we didn't know Mrs. Thatcher well. I mean, she knew me mainly as the person who'd argued with her on this previous occasion. But she introduced herself by saying, Good morning, gentlemen. I am Sir Keith Joseph's campaign manager. What can you tell me? Well, we had a rather large, long conversation. It was very interesting. But the upshot of it was, of course, that Keith, very shortly afterwards, blew himself up. He made us, he was the kindest, most considerate, and most charitable of men. But he made a speech in which he quoted two left wing sociologists referring to social classes four and five and the fact that they had a lot of children whom they didn't then look after well or bring up well, producing a cycle of deprivation. The press then said that what he was urging was birth control for the working classes, uh. regulate the birth of the world, and he had to withdraw. Mrs. Thatcher stepped into his place and she fought an extremely tough and clever campaign, and a very tough campaign was fought, fought against her um, as well. But she came out the winner, and, um, and I've just been reading the diaries of a Labour um, Secretary of State, Barbara Castle, who writes in the diaries that she was thrilled by Mrs. Thatcher's emergence. Even though it wasn't going to be good for the Labour Party, she said, and even though it wasn't going to be, uh, and it, it wasn't going to be good for the things she believed in, still it was wonderful for women, and it was wonderful to see a woman who had such command and control. John, let me quote her to you once again. Margaret Thatcher, I am not a consensus politician. I am a conviction politician. She repeated that often. Why? She repeated it, Peter, because uh, in the jargon of the day, people thought that they should aim at consensus. Uh, so we all sit around a table, you believe A, I believe B, so we end up agreeing on C. And she said, well, <clears throat> that's all very well when there's a narrow difference between you and you're arguing about details or how best to implement a common program. But it's not going to work if you are arguing about principles. And mm -hmm. what has gone wrong with this country in the last 30, 40 years we're talking now, she said this in 1975. What has gone wrong with it is that people throw away their principles. They run on one set of principles. They say they believe in liberty and free enterprise. But the moment they get in, they then immediately try to do a deal with the labor unions or with the opposition, with the Labor Party, or with the powerful vested interests uh, of industry. Uh, in, in, uh, interests which were not really in favor of free enterprise, though they often use the term, but were in favor of corporate enterprise in which government and corporations got together and decided between them, often with the trade union cooperation, uh, how best to govern the country, almost irrespective of the policies discussed in the previous general election. Mm -hmm. One more quotation from Mrs. Thatcher before she became Prime Minister. Then, of course, we'll discuss her years as Prime Minister. This is two years before she became Prime Minister. Quote, we must not focus our attention exclusively on the material because, though important, it is not the main issue. The economic success of the Western world is a, product, a product of its moral philosophy. The economic results are better because the moral philosophy is superior because it starts with the individual. Moral this, moral that. Is it fair to say that Mrs. Thatcher didn't merely want Britain to become more prosperous? In some fundamental way, she wanted it to become better. That is exactly right. Now, when she started uh, in politics, the way for Britain to become better, people thought, was for its policies, its government policies, to, be, be, to become more compassionate to mm -hmm. extend the welfare state, to relieve poverty, to assist people to cope with the difficulties of life. And you know, a great deal of good was achieved in those years because of that. Um, but there was an, what, what Mrs. Thatcher saw early on, and what even now people writing about her have not fully grasped, it seemed to me, is that she saw that there was another set of virtues that the Britain needed to have, which it had always had, but which it had somehow lost sight of in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. And these virtues were what Shirley Robin Letwin, who was a friend of Mrs. Thatcher's, and also, by the way, a great Anglo-American political theorist, mm -hmm. what Shirley Robin Letwin called um, the vigorous virtues. These are virtues such as thrift, hard work, enterprise. And these virtues are essential 
to the government, to the to working, living in a free society. Unless you're someone who possesses them, you can't be a self-reliant person. And unless they're dispersed through the population, you can't expect authority to, to be dispersed to the population either, because they're not going to use it well. I mean, uh, uh, let's say you have a country that's composed nine-tenths of drunks. Um, mm. That simply isn't going to be a country that is successful, either politically or morally or economically. And she saw that, and it was very much part of, of her internal engine. However, uh, it came to her from her upbringing. Um, it's very important to realize that Mrs. Thatcher is a product of a certain kind of upbringing. And the upbringing uh, above the store in Grantham, England, I would say two things about it. First of all, yes, it was above the store in Grantham, England. Um, it, these were uh, the provincial values, the values of provincial England in the 1920s and the 1930s. They weren't smart, they weren't metropolitan. What they were were, um, well, they, they were the vigorous virtues. Um, in the case of Mrs. Thatcher, uh, she was, th those virtues were added to by an understanding at a s simple but important level of how markets work. She lived behind the store. If you went to a, a good grocer's store in the 1920s and 30s, you'd see big piles of coffee beans. You'd see big piles of sult sultanas labeled um, fr um, from Greece. You'd see all of these products. And she realized, partly from conversations with her father, who I think was a natural economist, that um, she realized that the free market had taken all the efforts of people in places like Egypt and Turkey and France and the United States and brought all these goods uh, to Grantham, where quite people of quite modest means could afford to buy, buy all of these things. Now, it was one half. The second half was her Methodism. She was brought up to be a good Methodist girl. Um, she was, uh, she, she, I'm a Catholic, and we often discuss these questions. And she had an affection, even a kind of sneaking envy for Catholicism, because the Catholic girls on their f going to their first communion were allowed to wear ribbons. Whereas the Methodists said, if you wear a ribbon, it's the first step to Rome. In other words, it was a very austere, somewhat stern religion, except in relation to music, where it has a wonderful musical tradition. But the effect of <coughs> Methodism was, in economic questions, is to urge people to make sure that they pay their full part in the world. She used mm -hmm. to, her favorite quotation almost, one of her favorites, was one from John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, who said, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And I think that th that process, uh, in order to earn you know, you, you've got to earn, you've got to save, and then you've got to share some of what you've saved and some mm. of your ex excess money with other people. And, um, and that kind of uh, religion was, I think, the, the most profound basis for Mrs. Thatcher's beliefs and actions. John, what do you make of it that in the, the crisis of the final phase of the Cold War, Margaret Thatcher becomes prime minister in 1979. Throughout most of the 70s, the Soviets are on the advance. Ronald Reagan is elected in 1980, takes office in January 1989. That in this final crisis, the United States had a man from the American heartland. This occurred to me as you were speaking just now. Mm. His values were in many ways so similar mm. to those of the prime minister from middle England. You're right. The, uh, the values of Ronald Reagan, the values of Margaret Thatcher were, I don't say absolutely identical, of course, but the overlap between them was so profound and so extensive that, yes, they, they got on right away. They knew what the other was about. Each mm. of them had a sense of the other person's values and personalities, and, and um, they liked each other. Uh, you know, they, they met first shortly after she'd become leader in her room in the House of Commons. Um, the meeting was scheduled, I think, to last for about half an hour. It ran on and on. Um, at the end of it, Reagan had agreed to send Mrs. Thatcher all his um, radio broadcast uh, uh, scripts and his columns and to stay in touch with her. And they did stay in touch. Uh, and um, she, uh, I think, saw something in him right away, which um, she, she eventually developed a very broad view of Reagan. She realized what he was about. At first, she was, I think, slightly starstruck. She was impressed by by his star quality. It was later on that she came to see 
what really lay beneath this apparent easygoing exterior. Mm. John, Margaret Thatcher becomes prime minister in 1982. Contentious years, she struggles. In April 1982, the military junta in Argentina invades the Falkland Islands, which have been British since the 18th century. Prime Minister Thatcher sends an expeditionary force to the South Atlantic to expel the Argentines after hundreds of deaths on both sides. It is often forgotten that the Falklands War was not a spat, it was a war. In June 1982, the Argentines surrendered. What did victory in the Falklands mean to Britain? Well, it meant a great deal, uh, and I'll explain why. Um, uh, but I, before I do, let me just go back to your last question and say, one of the things which linked Reagan to Thatcher uh, was their patriotism. Each of them mm. loved their country and was proud of it. Um, so much so uh, that in the 1979 election, when she was talking to Michael Brunson, a reporter from CNN, Mrs. Thatcher burst out with the following words, um, I can't bear Britain in decline. I simply can't bear it. Now, if you want to get a single explanation that will explain what Thatcherism and what Mrs. Thatcher was ab were about, uh, th th that sentence will give it to you. They were about reversing the decline of Great Britain. Uh, she felt it terribly strongly. Now, when she, when she fought that election, um, she did so uh, by presenting a program to reverse the decline in economic terms, because that was how it was seen. Um, the, the Britain of the late 70s was in a terrible mess. Um, inflation, uh, over mighty labor unions, endless strikes, all these things meant that the economy was doing very badly. But it was also, and had been, in a bad way in military, or in terms of patriotism, I should say, um, since Suez. The British actually had had some remarkable foreign policy successes in the 60s, like, for example, um, the Malayan, first of all, the Malayan emergency in the 50s, and then um, defeating uh, the attempt by uh, Sukarno and in Indonesia to take over Borneo. I mean, these were little talked about, but they were considerable successes. Mm -hmm. But the mood in Britain was of self-contempt and the belief that the British could do nothing. They could do nothing at home, they could do nothing economically, they could do nothing in foreign policy. We were a contemptible power. And that was something which she f felt strongly against. Now, the Falklands War was never part of anybody's game plan. Of course, how could it be? Uh, it was a, a part of the game plan of the Argentine junta. Uh, but the point was, when it actually happened, Mrs. Thatcher realized something which her ministers were slow to realize. She realized that she had been told by history, if you're going to solve the decline of Britain, this is where you start. You're not going to start with the economy. You're already doing things there, but they're going to take time to mature. But the f this is a war you didn't ask for and you didn't want, but it's one you have to win. And you have mm. to win it. It can't be some kind of moderate compromise of fudge that gives everybody half of what they want. And that's why she took the decision to send the, the uh, armada down to fight the Falklands. It was risky. It was dangerous. It might mean people being killed, which it did mean, as you said. It might mean if the British lost, and they could, that, we, uh, that she would lose office. But, but the fact was, if she didn't do this, then the whole project of revi reviving Britain, reviving it in every sense, would be lost. Mm. 1984, John. The government proposes to close 20 of the 175 coal mines that it owns. The head of the National Union of Mine Workers, Arthur Scargill, who is a public and avowed Marxist, takes his union out on strike. Prime Minister Thatcher, quote, we had to fight the enemy without in the Falklands. We always have to be aware of the enemy within, which is much more difficult to fight and more dangerous to liberty, close quote. The Prime Minister refuses to meet the Union's demands, and after a year out on strike, the Union concedes going back to work. By 1994, the Thatcher government had closed dozens of unprofitable mines and privatized the rest. In defeating the National Union of Mine Workers, John, what, what did Prime Minister Thatcher accomplish? Well, 
this was her second great victory, comparable in domestic politics to um, winning the Falklands War. Because the, the Conservative Party, but not just the Conservative Party, a big spectrum of British political life and the establishment had convinced themselves in the 1970s that you might do many things, but you could never defeat the labor unions if they were determined to fight you. And that was thought to be particularly true of the miners' union, which was known in England as the Brigade of Guards of the mm. union movement. So um, when uh, there was, in 1981, uh, four years before the event you're talking about, when in 1981 uh, Scargill and the Miners' Union presented uh, demands which were again difficult, Mrs. Thatcher basically went round the cabinet table and said, can we win this one? And the conclusion was, we can't. And so she did two things. She gave in in 1981, and she began the preparations to fight a battle of the same lines later on. That namely, for example, she made sure that the stocks of coal at the pithead were built up, that there were secure lines of communication where she could get the coal to the um, power stations, that kind of thing. And this was self-conscious, deliberate policy from 1981 onwards. Now, Scargill um, decided that he would uh, defeat the, the, the um, Thatcher government as he had defeated the Heath government of, uh, before. He couldn't, by the way, get his miners to vote for a national strike. Mm -hmm. When people talk about that, they forget that. He basically got one area, his own area, to vote for the strike, and then he sent those miners as flying pickets, essentially to bully and intimidate miners elsewhere to, um, to come out on strike. They didn't always succeed. The Nottinghamshire miners produced coal throughout the strike in defiance of the National Union, and, um, the, uh, and as a result, that was one of the reasons why the strike failed. Now, the fact that the strike was beaten, not compromised away, but actually beaten, was crucial because it meant that all of the reforms that Thatcher was pushing through were now not simply on the statute book, but everybody knew that they were um, entrenched. They were entrenched in practical politics. They, they were going to be the future. There was no turning back on them. And uh, as a result, people could invest in the country with greater confidence, managers could manage with greater confidence, and in general, uh, British capitalism was back uh, working well again. And, um, and finally, these policies were now the, common, the new common sense of British politics. So Margaret Thatcher wins a war in the Falklands. She wins a war here at home. As you mentioned, this fight against the National Union, of the Mine Workers Union, had a military aspect, the logistical undertaking of stockpiling coal and making sure that lines of transport were open. And yet you once told me that Mrs. Thatcher was the kind of woman who liked to plump the pillows in a room. Explain that, John. <laughs> Well, I think it's the inexplicable uh, mystery of personality, isn't it? Um, I've always said that Mrs. Thatcher was a combination of two contrary creatures. Uh, one uh, was the uh, ordinary British housewife, like Mrs. Miniver in the famous 1940s movie, uh, who liked going around making sure that everyone was comfortable, that no one was seated in a draft, that the cushions looked nice, that the tea was being properly served, and so on and so forth. And the other was this towering historical figure who fought wars, uh, defeated um, massive unions in strikes, uh, who was brave, um, led from the front, uh, highly uh, competent in debate and in um, administrative politics, making sure that the decisions that were reached um, w went through in a, in a more profound sense. Let me put it this way. Um, Tony Blair saw himself as the heir to Thatcher, and in many respects he wanted to pursue some, some of the same policies. Mm -hmm. But you know, the difference between them was this. When she decided on a policy, and she got the House of Commons to agree to it and went into law, she pursued that policy through the corridors of power in Whitehall. She went to endless committees. She made sure that it wasn't just something that people talked about. It actually happened. Government did it. Uh, this was a kind of administrative stamina, which explains the greater success that she enjoyed 
uh, over Blair, many of whose policies became little more than press releases. Mm -hmm. John, you were her speechwriter. What was it like to work with her on a speech? Oh, well, it was grueling. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it was grueling. You, you started in the morning very often. And for example, uh, the very first time I wrote for her, uh, I, I had done the draft, the first draft of the speech. I go into the room, at the cabinet table, she's there, uh, so on about sort of seven or eight other people who are going to help with writing the speech. Um, she then says, I was tremendously pleased about this. Um, well, John, it's a terrific first draft. Won't be, we'll have no difficulties in making a really good speech out of this. Uh, I saw that no one else around the table batted an eyelid. They just carried on looking bored and suspicious. And then we started work. That was at nine in the morning. Three the following morning, we got up and left the room, having left it only for cause of nature uh, and being fed while we were in the room by pots of coffee and sandwiches sent in. Uh, every speech she gave went She through. herself was in the room until three in the morning? Exactly, yeah, all the time. And, uh, and when she gave a major speech, um, Conservative Party Annual Conference, it would go through five drafts. It would sometimes go through three or four days' work. Um, a lesser speech might go through three drafts, but still be a whole day. So she took speeches seriously. And the reason was, she said, that this was a way of getting the government's political policy out there. If, if she would spent all her time working in government and not thinking about how the policies are being presented, she said she would have become, eventually she would have become a super civil servant and the policies mm. would have been those of the civil service. She would not have been able to argue the case so effectively, she did time after time, had she not had to sit down and think in political terms, why is this attractive? Why will people vote for this? What's our, what are our weaknesses? How is the Labour Party reacting? How can we attack them on that? Those kind of questions and dealing with them in long sessions in which she would eventually produce a speech. John, in your book, The President, the Pope and the Prime Minister, you describe all three, President Reagan, Pope John Paul II, and Prime Minister Thatcher as central to winning the Cold War. Now, Reagan's role is clear. He's the leader of the superpower. John Paul II, he's the Pope who goes to Poland, and there's an open-air mass that draws three million people, and before the whole world demonstrates the illegitimacy of the communist regime in Poland and throughout Eastern Europe. Margaret Thatcher is Prime Minister of a middling power. She won the war in the Falklands, but it remains by comparison with the Soviet Union and the United States, a middling power. How did she prove central to the end of the Cold War? <clears throat> I would say in a number of ways. First of all, <clears throat> I'll talk about the subordinate ways. One of them was that, for example, when the, um, uh, when the, uh, the Polish government, at the insistence of the Soviets, cracked down on solidarity, she and Reagan were two politicians who gave practical help as well as diplomatic support to solidarity and to the Polish people. And she was very, um, and, and they did this with the Pope and through the Pope and through church channels very often. But she was very forward. Of, of, of all the um, Western European heads of government, Mrs. Thatcher was clearly the, the head of government most verbally and practically sympathetic to the Polish people. So she pushed that along. Uh, secondly, the key, one very key moment in winning the Cold War was the uh, installation of the missiles in Western Europe, American missiles in Western Europe, to counter the Soviet uh, SS-20s in Eastern Europe. 1983. Yes, in 1983, it stretches, I think, into four and so on. This was highly controversial in Western Europe. There was a huge peace movement. Almost all the left-wing parties um, abandoned their previous support for the installation of these missiles, and some of the conservative parties became distinctly wobbly. Mrs. Thatcher was not wobbly for one moment. Indeed, she went to considerable lengths to go to the uh, Western European prime ministers and presidents and tried to stiffen their resolve to keep the missiles. And in one case, she accepted some missiles that, uh, that in this case, that Helmut Schmidt did not want to accept. Now, uh, that was the key moment in the Cold War. The Soviets threw everything into the, the battle, helped, did everything they could to help the very large peace movement, and they lost. Mm 
the, the missiles were installed. And at that point, it became impossible for the Soviets to win the Cold War. The best they could hope for was that it would be resolved on terms that were not humiliating for them. The, 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 and the third is her introduction uh, to Mr. Gorbachev, uh, to, to Ronald Reagan, and her endorsement of him as a way of allowing everybody to get out of the Cold War without anything like a hot one. What did it say about her fundamental view of the Soviet Union that one of the first people she asked to advise her after becoming prime minister in 1979 was the historian Robert Conquest? Well, it tells you that she was a um, very sensible and very able uh, cr uh, critic of the scholarship of that time. Uh, but there's more to it than that. Uh, I mean, Robert, uh, Robert Conquest, and he's a friend of mine, I think possibly of yours. Uh, Robert Conquest was somebody who had established in the 70s the role as the principal Sovietologist who was uh, skeptical of um, the peace promises and uh, attitudes of the Soviets. Uh, his book, The Great Terror, um, had become the Bible for people who were, by and large, um, robust uh, and re level-headed and realistic in their resistance to Soviet propaganda and their resistance to uh, the, the advance of the Soviets in, uh, in all sorts of ways, in Western Europe, in the, the, through the Royal Navy, through subversion elsewhere. Now, um, in, the 19, in 1975, shortly after becoming leader, um, of the Tory party, Mrs. Thatcher um, met uh, Robert Conquest and he wrote the speech, one of two speeches that led her, uh, she delivered in Kensington Town Hall, I think, and that led her to becoming uh, dubbed the Iron Lady by the Red Star, the Army of the Red Army. Uh, so uh, he was somebody whom she was aware of. Uh, he became a, a strong advisor to her. Uh, on foreign policy questions in general, and she was she remained reliant on his advice. I think all through the period uh, in in her in 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 office, and of course remained a good friend after. John, uh, Reagan and Thatcher, close friends, allies in this large cause of winning the Cold War and reviving the West, but it was it, it was a friendship that had its complications. For example and this may be the most important difference between them. Mrs. Thatcher quite consistently opposed, tried to get him to mute, to contain, to limit Reagan's strategic defense initiative. And yet in her memoir, she writes, I quote, looking back, it is now clear to me that Ronald Reagan's original decision on SDI was the single most important of his presidency, close quote. What was going on on that issue? First of all, uh, everything you say is true there, but it admits something, which is that of all the uh, leaders in Western Europe, she was always the most favorable to the to SDI, to the Strategic Defense Initiative. She um, she said so all along. She was far more favorable than her, than her own foreign office, mm -hmm. and she um, invited the Americans to bring British companies into the research and development of the SDI. So yes, she what she was critical of was the idea that it could provide a complete defense. Uh, against missiles. Uh, and now um, we can argue about that. Um, the fact was that she got angry with uh, Reagan at uh, Reykjavik because uh, he um, almost gave away um, the, the, the main missile um, uh, uh, the second, second strike in those talks. And she felt that if uh, we could no longer rely on American missiles to defend Western Europe, uh, then we would have to spend a great deal more money on conventional defenses. Right. And uh, that was a perfectly rational argument. Frankly, it's moot because the collapse of the Soviet Union shortly afterwards meant that we never had to think about that threat. But at the time, it seemed a very reasonable argument. And even, and it, it, as you say, it put them at log heads. But what happened, of course, is after the end of the Cold War, Gorbachev's advisors came out and said in the most direct way at a Princeton conference that um, SDI ha and, the, and the Star Wars speech had basically brought the R Russians to the realistic conclusion they couldn't win the Cold War. And uh, they'd have to, that together with the installation of missiles in Western Europe meant that they had to come to the conference table. And uh, there I think you have uh, you resolve the contradiction that you saw in what right. she said in her memoirs and what she said at the time. The end. In 1990, Margaret Thatcher is forced from office by a faction within her own conservative party. 
her friend, the historian Paul Johnson, writing in the Wall Street Journal last week, quote, it was a melancholy fact that she had become more imperious during her years of triumph, close quote. Is that what happened, John, that after 11 years as prime minister, Margaret Thatcher just became too much to take anymore? No, I don't think that is what uh, happened. Um, if that had been what happened, she might have been too much to take for cabinet ministers and their wives, uh, but she wouldn't have been too much to take for the British people. Uh, what happened was that in, um, and, and I'm, the mechanics of this, I think, would require a far longer explanation, but as a result of shadowing the Deutschmark and the policies designed to mop up the inflation that shadowing the Deutschmark may have contributed to, mm -hmm. um, the, she found herself, that she found her signal achievement of the first two terms, namely the de defeat of and control of inflation being put at risk and making sure that we meant, remained a non-inflationary uh, society and country um, effectively meant very harsh measures of restricting credit. People lost their houses. Uh, it, it, it changed the political atmosphere in which every other battle was being fought. People mentioned the poll tax. Yes, the poll tax was unpopular. She could have survived that if it hadn't been for the underlying deterioration in the economic situation. Um, and, and, and that was the case uh, in the uh, years that led to her downfall. Imperiousness, the British people never minded that while she was winning battles. Um, it was when some of her victories came into doubt that, it, that, that, that her imperiousness became perhaps uh, less persuasive, less admirable. John, can you contrast for an American audience Contrast Britain in 1979, when Mrs. Thatcher became prime minister, with Britain 11 years later in 1990, when she stepped down. Well, the most, uh, uh, let me put it this way. In 1979, we had the winter of discontent with all of the strikes and all of the consequences we've discussed before, the dead going unburied, the rubbish piling up in Trafalgar Square, strikers turning away heart patients from hospitals. Um, and when she left office, Britain was the fourth largest economy in the world. And even beyond that, um, the British economy continued to outperform its earlier self uh, all through the 90s and into Tony Blair's period of office. Uh, and that had an impact on Mrs. Thatcher's reputation and on Britain's reputation worldwide. Look at some of the things being written about her by the official and semi-official press in China. Uh, Asia has long had a very high opinion of uh, Mrs. Thatcher. Uh, Deng Xiaoping's reforms began uh, before hers did, or about the same time. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't the inspiration for them. But they both possibly drew some inspiration from Lee Kuan Yew. And Lee Kuan Yew, Deng Xiaoping, and others uh, uh, saw Mrs. Thatcher as a formidable uh, reformer. And they've never changed that view. Uh, in general, and there's a point I should have made before, Peter, when you asked me about the end of the Cold War, Mrs. Thatcher's principal, um, uh, principal contribution at the end of the Cold War were her economic reforms. Mm. Because the Soviet Politburo, sitting in Moscow, was able to look. Um, they had had 70 years of enforcing socialism on Soviet society, and it had produced an economic wasteland. She had just at one decade of opening up Britain to um, a free market society uh, based on sound money, and that had produced an extraordinary revival, a revival which continued until 2008 when all, all economies ran into a brick wall. Although, by the way, towards the end of that period, uh, Gordon Brown's prem, uh, chancellorship and premiership did a great deal to weaken the British economy that she had successfully built up. But, but, but that's the truth of the matter. By, by, um, uh, in 1976, 7 and 8, the um, uh, IMF, uh, the men from the IMF were sent in to revive, the, to bolster the British economy then on the verge of collapse. Um, not long afterwards, Mrs. Thatcher was going around the world giving advice to people who wanted to know how she'd worked these miracles. John, you knew her for some four decades, more than four decades if we start 
from the first meeting in the House of Commons when you had that row with her. What are you going to miss about her? Um, well, it's astounding, really, because um, one expects people of a certain age to, to die. One isn't. Um, one is never, uh, one, one is it's not supposed to be surprised by it. I was kind of surprised. Well, so he, so she is mortal, you know, one, th one thought. And a lot of people I found have written to me uh, because they don't know her, but they wanted to write to somebody who did know her and express their admiration for her and their feeling of loss at her departure. Um, so she left a very big hole in the world. Mm -hmm. And she left a hole in the lives of people who didn't know her particularly, well, didn't know her at all, um, because they looked to her as someone who not only achieved a great deal, but somehow someone who represented their values, who was the champion of the kind of decent, moral, hardworking life that they, she believed in and that they believed in, and that somehow or other gets cast aside or despised or anyway not celebrated as perhaps the Victorians celebrated it. So um, one will miss that influence, but I will simply miss the fact that she was an entertaining and amusing companion. You know, Mrs. Thatcher is often uh, criticized for being dull. I never found her slightly dull. Um, she sometimes criticizes um, going on about things. Well, she certainly did. But you know, when the day was over um, and she um, she would go into her office in 10 Downing Street, kick off her shoes, sit on the couch, say to me or to Charles Powell or to one of the people there, um, make me a nice whiskey. And um, then she'd open up. She'd say, she'd tell you, she'd say the most indiscreet things. Now, um, she could do that because she relied on the discretion of the people who were her companions. But one got an education in diplomacy and foreign policy and economics by sitting on the opposite side of a table from her or by sharing a drink with her. And at the same time, as I said, as we discussed a moment ago, this was the woman who on the one hand was arguing with Reagan or debating a gas pipeline or going over to see Gorbachev. She was the same woman who was coming out of the kitchen making bacon and eggs when the speechwriters needed to be fed after 10 hours of work. John, final question. We only have a couple of minutes. Lady Thatcher's funeral, a great affair of state conducted according to British tradition and emphasizing, I think, in a way, the basic continuity of British life beginning with Churchill, his straight state funeral, on now to laying to rest this woman who helped to win the Cold War. And it seems to me that, it, that this state occasion will pose an implicit question to Britain more of the same, more of this tradition, uh, the, the, the British, the generation, Churchill who beat Hitler, Thatcher who revived the country and won the Cold War, or does Britain turn its back on it and play Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead, which apparently is a, a major hit at the moment. What, what will be the meaning of the funeral? I think the meaning of the funeral will be that this country has lost a great figure, but that the opportunities for greatness um, remain uh, if we seize them. You know, she said something about at Reagan's funeral, which was actually initially addressed to her. Um, when he became, uh, when he entered government, the Italian politician Antonio Martino, who was a friend of Lady Thatcher's, um, responded to a congratulatory note. Um, and she had said, you're going to have a hard time of it. And he wrote back saying, yes, we have a lot of major problems, as bad as the problems that you faced in 1979. But, she said, but he said, we have one advantage you never had. We have your example. Oh. She said that about Ronald Reagan. And I would say that now about her. John O'Sullivan, special advisor and speechwriter to Prime Minister Thatcher and author of The President, the Pope and the Prime Minister speaking to us from London. Thank you, John. Thank you, Peter. For the Hoover Institution and the Wall Street Journal, I'm Peter Robinson. <laughs>